of 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit, God the giver, speaketh expressly. And that word is tremendous. When Dr. World taught it to the Waycor way back in 1974, this word speaketh means to speak distinctly. Well, speaketh expressly. The word expressly, the adverb, that's what really gives the energy to understanding this speaketh. God the giver speaketh expressly. And this word expressly, the adverb in English, which modifies and enhances the verb speaketh. So you say speaketh how, what, or when. Speaketh expressly. Expressly. Magnificent adverb here. It means specifically and personally and passionately and distinctly. So we have no leg to stand on if we get hit by the enemy and we say, well, I didn't know anything about that. No leg to stand on. Thus saith the Lord. And this is during the days of the church in reign. And I know I spoke plenty of this truth distinctly and specifically and personally and passionately as well as Victor Paul Werewolf and others that in the latter times, that's since Pentecost, some is certain ones, thank God it doesn't say everyone, or there'd be no room left for the remnant, certain ones shall absolutely depart from the faith. This is refer reference to the family faith that ties us together in one body. See, there's another figure of speech, one body. It perhaps is... It's perhaps the dominating figure of speech regarding the church of grace. Never thought of it much, but I think you'd say it's right up there at the top. But it's not the only figure of speech that references the church of the body, the church of grace. There's others, like we're called the temple collectively. There's others. But here it is shall depart from the family faith, giving heed, paying attention to seducing spirits. Seducing is deceiving. The word seducing keeps it in the sexual realm, doesn't it? Figurative sexual realm, not necessarily literal, but figuratively, certainly. It's a seduction. It's a beguiling. It's a flirtation with darkness. People that say, well, I'll try anything once. Boy, many times that's been famous last words. And doctrines of devils, daimonion. You see, daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, are the ruling devils in the Greek. Dr. Ware will call them five-star generals, the ruling spirits. Daimonion are the lesser devils, daimonion. And I trust we can spend some time on those words, but I just pointed out now. It's like in our Athlete of the Spirit production. We had, I think we had six organized Devil Spirit units collected according to long suitability. And one of them was animalistic and vicious. <laughs> I'd have made that group bigger if I'd have known what I know now. But anyway, we had six. And each group, we had four or five lesser devils, and we tried to pick dancers of less stature, and their costumes were a bit less elaborate. They were all quite vivid, but they were less elaborate, had less frills and headdresses and such on them. But each unit had a daimon, a ruling spirit, and this person was taller or larger or in some cases maybe a better performer you know we didn't make a big deal out of that because everyone was great but we used a daimon that would clearly show himself or herself as the rule ruler of these lesser spirits and I worked a thing into the choreography into the production you know I'd tell our choreographers what I wanted to illustrate and then they'd put their heads together and come up with these magnificent movements. I had something to do with, especially when we got into the athletic.
athletic competition, I, I was more involved in actually getting into choreographic detail and helping, but we had people capable in those categories, with, along with the music and the lighting and the coloring and everything else. But I said, Dr. Werrell had taught us that among the lesser devil spirits, the daimonion, there will be friction. There will be competition. They will argue and fight like a bunch of animals, like immature children. But, and, but I'd never forget him saying this, but the daimon never fight. Else Satan's kingdom is divided against his, uh, itself, and it would have already fallen. And Jesus Christ makes the point in Matthew 12 that his kingdom has not fallen. Still hasn't. But the daimon do not fight the ruling spirits. And so we worked a place in the production where the daimon settled the arguments among the smaller spirits. We had the smaller spirits scratching and clawing at each other in an animalistic manners, and the daimon stepped between them, straightened them up, backed them off, kept the dissension at bay. See, that's little things we learned to do based on what he taught us. So I think of that when I read Doctrines of Daimonio. You know, when I first saw this, I thought, boy, I thought it would have been daimon, that doctrines would be from ruling spirits. But no, look at all the thousands upon thousands of false teachers heaping to themselves these damn false teachers because of their itchy ears after their own lusts. Look at all the pitfalls. Every, everyone stand up yelling and screaming. There's this, how many self-help books are sitting in these bookstores and libraries? all claiming they've found the secret to life. And every culture, every language, throughout all times, you've had your resident self-proclaimed geniuses that know how to tell all the rest of us how we ought to live. So when I started thinking that through, all right, I see it. Doctrines of devils, daimonion, multiple lesser devils stirring up their own little cottage industry, cottage industry, of deception and lies and error. And of course then they speak lies and hypocrisy. They're always two-faced. Having their consciences seared, cauterized, scorched, sin, scalded, charred with a hot iron, a branding iron, 